Hello everyone and welcome. In this video we are talking about a feature that you will find in the Tesla Model Y that you will not find in the other Teslas and this is a heat pump. So we're going to be talking about the challenges with heating the cabin of an electric vehicle and many electric vehicles use resistive heaters for their cabins which are basically 100% efficient. So how could there be a better solution than something that's nearly 100% efficient? And first off a big thank you to the Monroe Live YouTube channel. They supplied me with a bunch of b-roll so I could show some of the different components involved with the Tesla Model Y heat pump. And if you'd like to see a more detailed breakdown of the Tesla Model Y I will include some links to their channel in my video description. So to better understand the problem with electric heating, first let's talk about combustion vehicles, which happen to be extremely inefficient. However, this inefficiency turns out to be an advantage in terms of heating the cabin. So if you look at an engine, a combustion engine, well there are coolant jackets around those piston cylinders, and these coolant jackets take the heat from those piston cylinders and they circulate it throughout the engine and they circulate it either to the front of the car where you have a radiator and you can reject that heat to the atmosphere or you can send it to a heater core in your cabin and put that heat from the engine and stick it inside your cabin. So if you look at the efficiency of a combustion engine, if you take the total amount of energy that you have in that fuel, about a third of it is wasted as heat in the coolant, about a third of it is wasted as heat out the exhaust, you just send that energy out and away, and about a third of that energy is then useful to do, create mechanical power and do useful work. And so from that, uh, basically this coolant wasted heat and this exhaust wasted heat uh, is just completely wasted. There's no real use for it. However, in the case of heating the cabin, let's say it's cold outside, well suddenly there is a use for that wasted heat. And so from the coolant, you're able to take a portion of that heat and simply stick it inside the cabin. And because it was not going to be used otherwise, this means it doesn't actually reduce your vehicle's range. So if it's cold outside, you're not going to lose efficiency because you're simply taking heat from the heater core. So how does this differ with electric cars? Well, electric cars often use PTC or resistive heaters. And so they are getting the energy to heat that cabin from the battery. So the battery is going to send a current through a resistive element, that resistive element heats up, you blow air across that, and then you heat your cabin. So you're directly pulling energy from your battery and sticking it inside the cabin. Now the way that we measure how efficient these are, how effective they are, is the coefficient of performance. So the coefficient of performance is equal to the heat supplied that's going into your cabin divided by the work required, the energy that's coming from your battery. And so for these resistive heaters, that tends to be about 100% efficiency there. So of the heat supplied, of the amount of energy that you stick in to that cabin to turn into heat, it all turns into heat. Wonderful. The challenge, however, obviously, as you can note, is that that heat is coming from the energy from the battery. So that means you're actually reducing your range by using this battery to heat the cabin. That's why, you know, in electric cars, they'll say, use your seat heaters, use the steering wheel heater, uh, because heating the entire cabin takes a lot more energy than just heating up a seat or maybe a steering wheel. So it does actually affect your range. The advantage of using these resistive heaters is that it's instant. The second you get in the car, you turn on the heat and you're already getting hot air. That's a beautiful thing. Now, electric cars still have radiators, so why don't we use those radiators, that wasted heat that it's obviously being rejected from the motors and controllers and battery, why aren't we using that heat to heat the cabin? Well, you can, but there are a few challenges associated with it. So those three challenges are, first of all, electric cars are significantly more efficient, which means there's just less heat overall that you're going to reject. Now, because they're so much more efficient, that means it's going to take a lot more time to heat up that coolant. So that means if you're gonna wait for the coolant to be hot so that you can be warm in the cabin, it's gonna take forever to do so. You have to wait with combustion vehicles, but because combustion vehicles are so inefficient, it doesn't take that long to get some heat out of it. And finally, electric cars tend to have lower peak temperature with their coolant. Electronics are more sensitive to temperature than combustion engines and so the coolant temperature is often kept lower meaning your differential in temperature between your coolant and your cabin will be smaller so it's not going to be as effective at heating your cabin versus using that really hot coolant that engines make. 
So what does the Tesla Model Y do? Well, the Tesla Model Y uses a heat pump, and heat pumps are nothing new. They've been around for quite some time. Uh, and in fact, Nissan claims they were actually the first to use one in a production vehicle. In a mass-produced vehicle, Nissan had the first in the Nissan LEAF. But it is certainly a more efficient way of putting heat within the cabin of an electric vehicle. So how does it work? So here we have a diagram of a simplified heat pump and essentially it operates just like an air conditioning system. However, the order of operations is reversed. And so we have our four components, our four main components here. Uh, in actuality, it will be a bit more complicated than what we have on the whiteboard. But as a basic overview, you have a compressor, a condenser, an expansion valve, and an evaporator. So you're taking that compressor and you're compressing a gas uh, refrigerant. So you have a refrigerant circulating throughout this cycle here and it's entering the compressor at a low pressure and a low temperature as a gas. You then compress that refrigerant and now it's at a high pressure and a high temperature and it is still a gas. It then goes into the cabin of your vehicle and it enters the condenser. So the condenser starts to cool down this very high pressure, very high temperature gas and so it changes from a gas into a liquid as it's passing through and you're blowing air across this condenser into the cabin in order to heat the cabin. So you're taking heat out of this condenser and putting it into the cabin. So you now have still a very high pressure, high temperature liquid that is leaving this condenser. Not too much heat uh, overall compared to how hot this is was actually extracted from it. So that high pressure, high temperature liquid then goes to an expansion valve and that expansion valve basically controls the rate at which you allow the liquid to enter an evaporator. So you're slowing down the rate at which this liquid is entering here and so that's dropping its temperature and dropping its pressure dramatically. So it's still a liquid but you've reduced its pressure and temperature and then it moves through an evaporator. And so now the outside air is blowing across this evaporator and it's heating it up. So it's heating up that liquid and then the liquid is boiling, absorbing a bunch of energy and changing into a gas. So then you have a gas that is entering that compressor that's at a very low temperature and a very low pressure and you compress it and the cycle repeats itself. So you're compressing uh, that energy and you're taking energy from outside the vehicle, compressing it down, sticking it in a condenser, and then extracting that heat, extracting that energy, and putting it inside of the cabin. And this gives you a coefficient of performance of about three to four. So remember, before we're looking at the amount of work required versus the heat supplied, we're getting a coefficient of about three to four versus with the uh, resistive heater, we're looking at a coefficient of performance of just one. So how in the world can something be three or 400% efficient? Well, it's not really. Really what's happening is it's just doing something different. So it's taking energy from outside and it's sticking it inside your car. So if you look at the cycle and what's happening, there's two places where energy is coming in and there's one place where energy is going out. So you're bringing in energy in that evaporator in this stage right here, you're bringing in energy from outside. Yes, the outside air is cold, but your evaporator is even colder because of that refrigerant passing through it. And so because it's colder than the outside air, you're actually heating up that evaporator, heating up that liquid, that refrigerant passing through it. So you're adding energy in from outside, even though it's cold outside, then you add more additional energy in from the battery, which runs the compressor, and then combining that energy, you dump it all in the cabin, and then the cycle repeats itself. So the important thing is that you can pull in a lot of energy from outside, even though it's cold outside, there's still plenty of energy out there that you're basically compressing down and then sticking inside of your cabin. Versus the resistive heater, you're just taking energy from inside your battery and moving it to the inside of the car. So it's just going from your battery into your car rather than from outside into your car. So that's why this looks like it's operating at a higher efficiency. It's because it's taking energy that already exists and just changing where it's located sticking it inside of the car. So as an example of what this coefficient of performance means, let's say in order to heat your cabin, you need three kilowatt hours total of energy to bring that to a nice toasty temperature. Well, using a resistive heater, because it has a coefficient of performance of one, it's going to take three kilowatt hours from your battery to do that. Using a heat pump, you're only going to need one kilowatt hour from the battery because of that coefficient of performance being 3.0. 
Now, unfortunately, the conversation often ends there, and there's a major point left out. So don't just simply go off thinking, okay, well, heat pumps are three to four times better than uh, using resistive heaters, the end. When in reality, uh, the colder it is outside, the less effective your heat pump is. And now you're thinking, well, wait a minute. If it's colder outside, that's when I want to be using a heat pump. And that's absolutely right. So eventually, remember, we're taking energy from outside. So the colder it is outside, the smaller our temperature differential between outside and our evaporator and thus the less energy we can pull in from outside. So eventually there will come a temperature at which your evaporator and outside are the same temperature. You're no longer pulling in any energy and as a result of that your coefficient of performance all of your energy going in goes to turning into heat and so you have a coefficient of performance of one again instead of three to four. So at some cold temperature uh, it starts to level off and the advantage of it starts to go away. Now it's massively helpful in most driving conditions. Most of us don't live in Antarctica. I know those of you that do are going to be sure to let everyone know in the comments that it's minus 40 C where you live uh, every day and that sounds cold. That sounds very cold so uh, it's unfortunate. Uh, heat pumps won't be as effective for you uh, than a lot of the folks out there that live, you know, freezing temperatures, not a problem. It's still going to be useful. I, I don't have an exact number. I read through a good number of studies and I couldn't find an exact number, but trusty old Wikipedia uh, was saying that your coefficient of performance will get to about 1.0 by the time you're at about minus 20 C or zero degrees Fahrenheit in real world conditions. And part of it too is the evaporator obviously gets very cold and so you can have frost start to form on it. And so as you build up ice and frost on that evaporator, it's not going to be as effective at transferring ambient temperatures to the refrigerant circulating within it. So still all of it is very cool and it is a massive improvement as far as real world efficiency is concerned driving in cold temperatures for electric vehicles uh, which is going on this Tesla Model Y. Very neat system, quite clever packaging. Again if you're interested in seeing some Model Y breakdown videos I've got some links in the video description to the Monroe Live YouTube channel. Thank you all so much for watching. If you have any questions or comments of course feel free to leave those below.